Hello and welcome everybody. Good afternoon, welcome to Book Passage and another special Conversations with Authors event. I'm your host, Paula Farmer, and I'm so happy to be hosting our featured author today, Kate Milliken, and her in-conversation partner, uh, Melissa Sestero. Um, thank you for supporting our virtual program. And for those of you who live in the Bay Area, uh, very soon you can actually um, get a combination. You can continue to get our virtual programming, but you can also come into the store safely for in-store events. Um, those will be starting up very soon. Um, and we will continue the uh, virtual one, but we will allow for some of them to be in person. So definitely catch uh, all the details on our website and we're constantly updating information of events and whether they're virtual or in store. Um, so our featured book today, Kept Animals by Kate Milliken, focus on our protagonist, Rory Ramos, who is a dutiful daughter, a teenager who works as a ranch hand at the stable for her stepfather, uh, the one that he manages in uh, Southern California. She often rides for rich clientele and one uh, including uh, the twins of some rich clientele. And she, because she's of, um, a, you know, she's more working class, she observes them from a distance. One day though, one day though, because of an unfortunate event, their lives intertwine. And uh, the elements that drive the story tend to be how those lives intertwine, what brought them together. And I'm telling you, this book is, as so many people have been saying, it's stunning, it's riveting, it's gorgeously written debut novel. Kate Milliken is the author of uh, the 2013 Iowa short fiction um, collection of stories called If I'd Known You Were Coming. She's a graduate of Bennington College writing seminars, and she has received fellowships from Vermont Studio Center and the Tin House Summer Workshop. She lives in Northern California, so just in our area here, and cut, uh, Kept Animals, as mentioned, is her stunning debut. Uh, helping to shepherd the conversation today is Melissa Sestero. She has worked on multiple sides of the literary industry, including helping authors complete and publish their manuscripts, collaborating with publishers, editors, and working in the bookselling trade. She is the author of the award-winning memoir, Pieces of My Mother, and the best-selling Canadian book, Without My Mother. Her stories, essays, and interviews have appeared in such publications as the New Ohio Review, Brevity, The Huntington Post, and so much more. But probably more important is Melissa is a friend of the store. She is a former uh, host of events. Um, and we, we are now missing her because she's in Canada, but she's with us virtually. And we're so happy to have both of them take the book passage stage virtually. With that, I will pass it to Melissa. Thank you, Paula. So it's so wonderful to see you. And, um, and thank you just to my absolute favorite independent bookstore book passage um, and to Paula for that lovely introduction and and just everyone at book passage for making these really important um, events come together. And uh, Miss Milliken, I am so happy to be talking um, again with you um, about your just your remarkable novel and um, that's now available in paperback. So that's that's wonderful. Um, here, I'm gonna switch my view real quick here. Um, and um, I thought it would be nice to uh, just begin with a short introduction about our connection. Um, so Kate Milliken and I um, crossed paths at a bucolic riding stable uh, in Topanga Canyon in the 1990s. Um, we had both fallen hard for horses um, Kate was uh, riding in three-day eventing at the time, 
And I came in to, to teach some lessons to some of the beginner students there. And we were both there when uh, in, on November 2nd, 1993, when a fire broke out on the ridge, just above the stables was the starting point. And we were ordered to evacuate immediately. And as I was fleeing down Old Topanga Road, I think Kate was heading up uh, the treacherous terrain to save horses. And if I go back to that day in 1993, I can almost feel our brief intersection on that road. Um, and that fire, uh, it blazed for nearly 11 days, burning more than 18,000 acres and destroying 400 structures and homes. And I don't think at that time, either of us could have foreseen that we would both leave horses behind and both become writers. <laughs> and it is the word writer and rider. Um, it was that those words that allowed us to untangle our connection more than 20 years later. Uh, and Kate, do, would you like to kind of give your um, version of that, that story of our reconnecting? Because I think it's, it's, such a, it's such a great story. Um, it is almost, absolutely, sure. It's, uh, it's almost unbelievable, our reconnection. <laughs> Yeah, so you and I had actually met um, at a in a writing writing group, right? At Book Passage. At Book right? Passage, we yes. sat down next to each other, and I turned to you and said, "I'm not sure this is the right group for me." It was, I think, Writing Mamas, and um, we both wanted to just sort of work with one other writer, and we started trading work. And somehow, I think we were doing that for you and I were meeting for coffee and writing together um, for over a year, I think. And then we were at an event um, for Why There Are Words. Uh, we were at a Why There Are Words event. And you happened to say, when I used to teach writing, and meanwhile, I had already started writing this book, but I had never shared any of it with you. And I had a character in this book that was based, the only character in this book that I literally based on someone I had known at that barn where we rode together. And you said that, and I thought, oh my God, she's Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and I started losing my mind because I realized you were that riding instructor that I had been thinking of 20 years before. Yeah, that was just wild. I mean, it, it was such I had to change the I had to change this character drastically once I realized it really was you, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's pretty crazy. I, I just remember you because we had known each other for like a year and a half, and and you saying, "Wait, I know you. You're a character in my novel." <laughs> so so that is why, yeah, absolutely why we are here. And I just I think the connection. Um, is remarkable. Yeah. So um, I, I continue to share that story. I, I was telling someone yesterday about it, um, my, my advisor at the university here. Um, so, okay, well, I think that um, I love hearing you read your work. And um, would you um, like to share something from Kept Animals with us? Um, and if you need to preface anything, uh, please do. Um, and if anyone wants to leave a comment or question along the way as Kate's reading, um, we'll, we'll be taking that into, uh, into consideration to uh, answer. And um, yeah, I'd, we'd love to hear um, some of your just beautiful prose and, and please just enjoy this story and Kate's reading for a few minutes. And Thank we'll go from there. Melissa, I just want to say quickly before we get too deep into the conversation, I really want to say thank you to Paula and the book passage and to you um, all the way from British Columbia. And um, I, we had planned on launching the hardback together at book passage. And then when the hardback came out three weeks into the pandemic, obviously we couldn't do that. Um, so it's such a treat to finally get to have this conversation with you. Um, finally, yes, finally. <laughs> yes, finally, again. Um, this book has been a part of our story for so long. Um, I, so I thought I would just read from the very beginning of the book so that we can, when 
you know, for those who have not read the book, uh, you can have a sense of the fact that this is a book that is a multi-generational story. We have the main narrator in first person, Charlie, and she is collecting the stories of what really happened in 1993 surrounding that wildfire that um, Melissa and I both experienced. So I'll read you the prologue and just the opening scene so you have a sense of sort of the main characters. Um, and some of what you've already said is here. <laughs> here we go. Uh, on the morning of November 2nd, 1993, just a half mile up the road from where my mother was working as a stable hand, a fire started in Topanga Canyon, California. Fueled by Santa Ana winds gusting 60 miles an hour, the flames raced from the canyon summit, jumping switchbacks, bursting open chaparral, swallowing Manzanita whole, and reached the Pacific Ocean in record time. Despite an unprecedented number of firefighters, trucks, and air tankers dropping water from the sky, the fire's path and rate of consumption were dictated solely by the wind. From Calabasas to Malibu, residents fled, circumnavigating bottleneck roads on foot, by horse, by rollerblade. Those who had them boarded boats and watched from the water as the coastline burned, a glowing snake cutting through ash thick air, day turned to night. Mama once told me that if you cut down a canyon oak, you can see within its rings the marks of the fires it has withstood, wisps of smoke in the shape of half a heart. Even before I had been told them, I could feel these stories unfurling within me, stories of events that happened before I was born, their heat still palpable. In the end, the old Topanga fire consumed over 18,000 acres, nearly 400 homes, and the lives of countless animals and the people who tried to save them. That area of the Santa Monica Mountains is known as a fire corridor, its topography and ecology inviting such large scale burns. Yet this fire's cause remains listed as arson. They've never known who to blame. Topanga Canyon, California, July 24th, 1993. So this is three months before the fire actually begins. Rory, she was then just Rory, not yet anyone's mother, saw it first and thought it was a dog a small breed, a Karen or a Spaniel pup that had snuck beneath a fence seeking food or affection only to get its first pat of the day from the fender of a speeding car. It was not yet dawn and the canyon's walls were denim blue under the moon's soft light. Rory leaned forward to see the animal better and Gus, her stepfather, pulled the truck over. They'd come across roadkill nearly every morning, deer, rabbits, even a coyote, bodies in the road, noses pointed toward their last intention. Ever since school let out for the summer, Rory had been rising in the dark, waking Gus, running to work her full list of horses before the sun reached its scorching height. That's a fox, Gus said. The rust-hued fur, the blackened lines of its muzzle and tail were apparent in the beam of the headlights now. Rory sat back, relieved. She'd been imagining looking for a collar, having to call the number on the tag. I've lived here 20 odd years and I've seen only one other. Had eyes the size of plums, Gus said making rings with his fingers, looking through them at Rory. Come on, she said, quit playing, let's move it already. I can get this one, Gus said, putting his hand to the roof to lift himself out. He'd put on weight, Rory worried about his heart. After the deluge of rain the winter before, Governor Pete Wilson had declared an end to six years of drought, but the lawns in the valley were only coming in green now because the rains that had hit the canyon ran down its parched crevices, never sinking in, going on to feed the LA River, the reservoir, and all those automatic sprinklers instead. The canyon's creeks were dried to cracking already, and Gus said the animals they kept finding had wandered from their beaten paths hunting water. Burying them was beside the point, taking a vulture's work, but he'd agreed they could stop and move the bodies, sparing them from being speed bumps the canyon's tourists winced over. Weeks ago, when they'd found the coyote, Rory felt compelled to say something. Not a prayer so much as an apology on behalf of mankind, and she'd said a few words for every animal since. Gus obediently lowering his head, then mumbling, that was good, when Rory was through. She closed her eyes now, readying words, but Gus was making a racket in the flat bed of the truck, a bucket dumped out, a bridle tossed aside, the metallic clank of bits and buckles. She turned around in time to catch the silken drape of the fox slipping from his hands and into the empty bucket the feline liquidity of its fur. She was still fixed on the bucket when Gus closed himself back into the truck. Is it alive, she asked, Bruce Flesh riding her arms. If it's still alive, we could, 
She was imagining spoon feeding it, warming it beneath saddle pads, nursing it back to health. Gus tipped his hat off and gave a nearly imperceptible shake of his head. But Rory started, if it's dead, Gus was looking into the well of his hat. You should say your little prayer. My little prayer, she said. Why is it in the bucket? Why would you keep it? You're the one. She was about to remind him of the vultures, the cycle of life, the notions he'd fed to her. She was realizing just to keep them moving. She stared hard at him as he pulled the truck back onto the road, the twitch of a secret smile beneath his beard. She put her boots up on the dash, knowing how he hated it. She won't like this, Rory said. He rolled down his window and ran his hand through his straw gray hair. Both of them knew she meant Mona, Rory's mother. 10 years ago, when they'd moved into Gus's house, Mona insisted he locked up all evidence of his old hobby. Rory, just five years old then, had a particular fascination with the birds, sitting motionless on perches, not yet understanding what taxidermy involved. In all these years, she hadn't wondered if he still did it, but he hadn't given her reason to wonder until now. Did you hear what I said, she asked. They were cresting the mountain, nearing the ranch, the day's first light splintering through the trees, a sandy light. I did, she said, and turned the truck down the driveway and under the ranch's iron archway that read Leaning Rock Ranch, Equestrian Training and Boarding. They weren't the first to arrive. The gold convertible Mercedes belonging to June Fisk of the Fisk twins was already pulled in alongside the L barn, the coveted space that stayed shadiest the longest. The other cars, each one dustier than the next, belonged to the men who lived and worked on the ranch. Tomas's was the worst of all, up on cinder blocks, yet to run. Gus pulled in next to the office and hoisted the parking brake, rocking them back in their seats. Behind them, the bucket tipped over with a fleshy thud. Jesus, Rory said, can we please just bury it? This place is a tinderbox, Gus said, ignoring her, looking up at the hillside. Rory had heard his theories about the downpours, about the winter rains being what actually ushered in wildfires by growing the ground fuel. Just you wait, Gus said, it'll be one of you. He looked toward June Fisk's Mercedes, lazy with your cigarettes, flicking a match out of the car. It won't take much. One of us, Rory asked with a laugh of disbelief. Each of the Fisk twins, June and her brother Wade, owned horses more valuable than their cars combined and neither of them ever said more than a half sentence in Rory's direction. She made a stable hands wage of three seventy five dollars an hour, exercising horses for people like them, people with air-conditioned homes and beach vacations, people who could afford a lack of commitment. Every other day, Rory had to ride Wade's chestnut Hanoverian journey. The fists don't even know my name, Rory said. Besides, she started, I don't smoke. I'll tell you what, Gus interrupted, lifting the toes of her boots and dropping them off the dash. You don't tell your mother about this. He tipped his head toward the back of the truck. And I won't tell her about you sneaking her cigarettes. Seriously, Rory said. She had taken maybe a dozen, but so carefully and over weeks. Seriously, Gus said, his eyebrows lifting with the challenge. I'll stop there. Oh, I, I, I still get chills listening to that opening. I just, it's interesting hearing it again there's so much laid into this this short bit that you've read that carries through the story. Um, it's really, really well done. It, it's all those little clues that we don't know yet, but they're all gonna, they're all coming. Um, I, I just was fascinated by Gus's, um, his hobby of taxidermy. And I was thinking about how this really does, it's a, a such a memorable motif that really, um, comes very early in the story. I mean, it really opens the story. Um, and I know we've talked about this before, but I'd love for you to share that, um, how that particular motif came into this story, um, presented itself for you. Sure, I, um, you know, I've always been a little bit fascinated with taxidermy and it wasn't until I was just back in Topanga recently and um, I was in that store, Hidden Treasures. Mm -hmm. That store, well, that's, yeah. Yeah. I, I did not remember this at all, but the walls of that store are just um, full of taxidermied animals. And, there, and, I, <laughs> and I thought, oh, maybe that's where the seed of this was planted was that I that huh. was somewhere in my subconscious, but it was actually the photography of Francesca Woodman, um, 
that mm. marked almost the whole novel for me in a lot of ways. Um, she has a photograph of a young woman falling out of a curio cabinet that is also full of taxidermied animals. Um, and it was that photograph that sort of um, exemplified a feeling that I had been wanting to capture about that time in my life and in, um, in the 90s in Southern California, like this very, this sort of feeling of being trapped, but also fully alive and in touch with your animal side, but not able to um, embody it. And so it was the combination and photography has always played a big part in my life. So it was sort of the combination of photography and art and, and this, this Francesca Woodman image. And I just started writing the scene between Rory and Vivian um, where Rory is photographing Vivian and she ended up being the character falling out of that curio cabinet. Um, and I wrote it as a short story at first um, and, and sort of had to figure out who was taxidermying the animals. Why was this out, you know? And, and build out from there. Once I knew I was writing more than a short story, um, that there was just so much. It was just one of those fabulous things of like everything occurring to me at once. Mm -hmm. um, all of the threads of the narrative of knowing it was going to be a much bigger thing than I'd written before. Yeah, I I love that. How you know one thing can have an impact, and then you know you carry it forward into this novel, um, and I. I, I still just love your title, Kept Animals. Um, I just think it's it's such an evocative title and it so fits the book on so many different different levels. Um, do you have a story about um, that you can share about where that title came from or how or how early on it came or did it did it it, it was attached to that short story, actually. It was the, the <laughs> title of that short story. I can't remember now. It was sort of like one of those, um, maybe, it, you know, I, I wrote that short story, I think, in 2010 or 11. Um, and maybe I was trying a little too hard. It was like a much longer title, like, the, you know, the backstory of kept animals or something. It was, it was overwritten. Yeah. But the one phrase, kept animals, never went away. And I had an early reader that was like, this is this is perfect. This exemplifies kind of everyone in there. Even there's, you know, the idea of being well kept as an affluent person. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of the, the Sarah Price, who is the wife of a movie star in the book, and the idea that she's well kept, but she's actually incredibly miserable, um, mm. even prior to the accident that uh, leaves her without a one of her children in the accident. Um, so yeah, I, I knew that it, it, it spoke to the, the teenage protagonists in the book. It spoke to the horses in the book, um, just this idea of us being contained. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Not being able to be fully Right, and then of and then of course the taxidermy, you know, yes. with Gus and, and all that. Um, I was um, in Book Passage uh, quite some years ago, uh, and I was talking to the wonderful poet Jane Hirschfield, um, and um, we were talking about horses because she's a horse horse gal. She rides, um, and I somehow I told her that I've I've never written about horses. And one of the things I said to her is, it's, I've never written about horses because they are the thing that broke my heart. Hmm. The one thing that broke my heart because it was something I was so passionate about as a, as a younger gal. And I had hoped to, you know, it was gonna be my life basically. Um, and she said, that then is what you need to write about. Um, so I'm curious, with you, um, was it was it the characters that that populated the barn at the stables that that kind of surfaced first, or was it the horses, or the fire, or sort of the whole mix of of the ecology there? What what was the thing that kind of came first in in this story? And I know it's been a lot of years that you worked over, you know. Through when from when you started to when you finished, but is there a seed? What would yeah? What, is there I mean, to it? Uh, it definitely in terms of I had read um, Aaron Kyle's beautiful novel, The God of of 
the god mm. of animals. Oh, the god of animals. It's just called the god of animals, which is probably where I got the animals part of my book. But that's a beautiful book about a young woman on a ranch in Montana, and it involves horses. And reading that book, I remember reading it in one day, like while it was raining. And I just, I hadn't had the urge to go back to being in a barn in such a visceral way. Like she took me to the smells, the sounds, like just everything that you relish about those memories. I didn't have the same heartbreak, maybe. I feel like horses were the thing that kept me from having a broken heart as a kid. Like mm. that, was, um, that was where I felt the most alive. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, I knew I had these two girls that had been kicking around in other stories that I'd written. And then they appeared in the Captain Animals story, Rory and Vivian uh, specifically. Um, and their love story. And it had always, um, it, it had kept coming back to me. And so I knew I was going to write about them, but I, I realized reading Aaron Kyle's novel that I really wanted to go back to that barn and that there was um, something about that experience of um, that time, that specific time in, in California, um, feels very prescient right now in this moment. Um, <laughs> of having a Republican governor and uh, the level of racism and the homophobia. And like, there was this, just, you know, we were on the other side of the 1992 riots and we were the year out from when Prop 187 would be passed. And Pete Wilson would be reelected based on this totally racist platform. And that feeling of like, like you just feel like the world is so disjointed. It's so disconnected from its actual true nature um, I, it felt like disaster was inevitable. Like that you, you had that feeling all around you in that era of something is going, something is going to spontaneously combust in this environment. And lo and behold, you know, we had 12 fires in a row at the end of October. And then we had that fire that personally impacted our lives at the uh, beginning of November. And it really was um, that feeling of like it was like a math equation. Like of course, if we have, you know, we're going to treat the community the way that we're treating them, if we're going to not honor women, if we're going like all of these things to me spoke to how we the earth too, right? Like that, and that I feel like that, like just all of it is of the same thing. It's not, it's not honoring a very specific thing in our animal beings. Um, and and where I felt centered and comfortable in my um, queer coming of age story was with horses. And so um, writing my way into that experience and writing my way out of it um, and writing my way out of that disaster was really, I mean, I'm sort of speaking on like a thematic level. I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture that feeling that I was growing up and understand it and, and realize that like I wasn't crazy. Like this, this, this was not, oh, this was not a good way to be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, got it. Um, technical issue there. Um, well, I, I mean, you capture all of what you're, you just relayed in this book. And if, if any of you um, listening haven't had a chance to read Kate's book, I mean, that's, I think that tension and that emotion and that, that time period and the place, you just, um, it's all there. And that's one of the things that makes the novel to me just so rich, richly layered and, and it's, it's, um, and it gets gritty and dark too. You know, we go we go the distance with the story. Um, and I, God, I remember that story, the God of Animals. I remember the cover. I remember just thinking, oh, like again, that same appeal to that with with the horses and the the life. Um, so in the story, there are three distinct uh, female teenagers and kept animals. There's Roy Ramos. Vivian Price uh, and June Fisk. And uh, there's also the narrator, Charlie. Uh, is there a, um, one of those characters that you felt most aligned with or were, was easier to write or you were more in sync? 
how about this? Was there any that were harder to write about it, or took longer to find of those characters? I can sort of answer all of those kind of quickly because of course, um, and just on like a generic level, I'm a part of all of them, right? Or they're all a part of me. So, but there's definitely, you know, Vivian was a lot more fun for me to write because she was sort of more a character that I've observed in my life. So she could be, you know, she's just sort of a vixen, but she's also got a depth that um, was fun for me to figure out and articulate. And uh, June Fisk, of course, is like, you know, bad girl, queer side, like total, she's just trouble. And that was fun to write. Um, Rory is the character that I probably feel the most aligned with, um, and that was absolutely the hardest for me to write. Um, it, was uh, very, it was very hard for me to have access to her um, internal monologue, which is like counterintuitive, right? Like if I feel the most connected to this character, why is it the hardest for me to, to put her on the page? Um, who knows? I don't know. Let's talk to my therapist. But. <laughs> Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I feel like a lot of, I've heard that from a lot of authors, that character that you most embody is actually the, the hardest because there's there's less imagination involved. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but yeah. Charlie, Charlie's first person voice, because she is of another generation and of another place, um, mm. was absolutely the hardest for me to get right. And the thing that I worked on right up until final copy edits. Um, and that it really wasn't until I went and spent time in her part of the story takes place in Little Snake, Wyoming. And it wasn't until I went and stayed in Little Snake, Wyoming on a ranch, just like literally right where she is is set in the book that I felt like I had the ability to, to give her voice, uh, you know, an authority. Yeah. In the book. Now that location, Little Snake, had you been there before? No. I know. <laughs> oh, I love it. I had no, I had this like idea in my head. I of course had this, you know, these romantic notions of Wyoming because I'm an Annie Brew junkie and um, I'd been through Wyoming, but I didn't, you know, and I read plenty about it and I kept doing these Google image searches of this area that I thought was, I needed a very small, tiny populated place. And all of a sudden, like eight years into researching this area, a ranch that had never been there popped up on the Google map. And I was like, wait, what? Like that's, did I manifest? I manifested Melissa like as a writing instructor. I manifested her in my life and now I've manifested a ranch. Like how is this possible? Um, so I, I wrote the couple that had just moved back to their family property and reopened this ranch. And my family and I went and stayed there. And, took pictures and went to the Little Snake River Museum in the area and it's just like the greatest little town and they run a um, they run a bike race out of there and they were they were busy living in South Africa running a, a bike racing team there so it's just amazing what the world can hold. <laughs> I, I love that I did not know that part of the story that's I, perfect wonderful um, I'm not I'm not gonna have to go to Little Snake Wyoming I guess with you. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> um, so kept, kept Animals made Oprah's list of the most anticipated uh, LGBTQ books of 2020. Uh, and that was a hard thing during the pandemic to get on any list yeah. for these books that came out. Um, can you talk a little bit about the themes of, of the sexuality and the entwined desires of the, the female characters that, that are in the book? Because it's it's great. It's very kind of yeah. intertwined. I mean, it was so much a part of my experience growing up in that time, like knowing that I was bisexual and not knowing what to do with that in that time period. Mm. It was a very homophobic time period. Um, really wasn't anything to be done with it, it just except to feel uncomfortable. So I think I put that part of my life into a lot of my writing and um, I feel like that's a good um, that's a good inroads for writing stories is imagining lives that you didn't live necessarily, um, but you that you might have. Um, so yeah, that was you know, and Rory and Vivian were actually characters in my story collection. They have different names, um, but yeah, it's just something I. Yeah, well, we have a great question that's that 
it kind of dovetails on that. Um, um, the question is about the book, is it a YA book? And if not, what differentiates it from YA um, as the characters are all teenagers? Well, the characters are all, well, not all the characters are teenagers. Um, right. Us and Sarah, Sarah is Vivian's mother and she plays um, a large part in the book and Gus, it's actually, it's sort of the folly of the adults that leaves you feeling that the teenagers are the adults in the narrative. Um, in, I, I wouldn't say that it's not why I, I think high schoolers can read it. It, it does get a little dark. Um, I think it deals with some pretty big themes in terms of misogyny and um, I'll throw I'll throw I'll throw a trigger warning up on the book. I I do think it's got adult themes, but I do I, you know, having a teenager myself now, I think that there's some the books can be very dark in the way. So I wouldn't advise against high school reading it, but it is um, it is about adult complicity in um, in systems of marginalization, I guess, uh, and sort of. Who who is who is to blame when things go wrong, and who pays the price? And of course, it's the kids. Mm, absolutely. Um, has your daughter read the my, book? My daughter has read um, a bunch of it. And okay. She's Thirteen, but that really—I mean—it's taken a lot of persuading, and there's been a lot of me saying we we can't keep reading it, and you know. Um, there's things that we need to talk about, but she like squirreled away a copy when it came out and I found it under her bed. So. <laughs> um, she oh. finished it, but she was really enjoying it. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. I mean, it's a great, there's, there's a lot of great messages in there too, as well. So, you know, she'll, I'm sure she's probably read more than you know. <laughs> so. yeah, I know she probably has read more than I know, and it's interesting because here I've written a story about a daughter trying to understand her mother. That is basically the essence of this book, right? Is it's one generation trying to get a grip on what had happened, how her mother became the person that she is. So now to have my daughter <laughs> reading my book on what my childhood was sort of like. <laughs> anyway, yeah, right. Well, that that. That brings up an interesting question, and it's um, it's one that someone asked me when my book came out. And the question was: Is which has helped you more as a writer, being an equestrian or being a mother? Helped me more. Wow, I want to know your answer to that. I I hadn't I hadn't thought about it. It really caught me off guard. Um, but I think one of the things I thought about was, you know, horses are these big, unpredictable animals. And, um, you know, there's a sense of danger. There's a sense of sensitivity. There is a, um, a mothering quality to working with horses, right? Like you really have to be attuned to these animals um, in a similar way that we have to be attuned to our, our children. Um, I would say, yeah, children are, are, for me, becoming a mother really informed my writing. And then it went further back to the horses and just sort of thinking about, um, you know, these beings that we, we work with or try to understand. Um, right. Yeah, it's, it's a strange question. I love that question. I think that's such yeah. a great question. I think, I mean, I think both of them have informed my writing so much. And I, I think both of them are really at the, at the, core of what makes you capable is the ability to be a good listener and that that's a big part of writing um, is is actually being a good listener to all, not just to everything around you but also to your own authority right and that um, that factors in a lot with parenting and I think I would say my writing life, my horseback writing life, <laughs> um, yeah. probably helped my my writing career in that it made me very persistent. Um, mm. Like just knowing that you get back on, you you keep going, you get thrown, you you get hurt, you have to do the dirty work, you have to, um, you know, that most of it is a lot of just mm -hmm. day to day habit, and there is very brief moments of glory, right? There's only the occasional ribbon ceremony or list. <laughs> um, 
it, whereas with parenting, it's like, you know, you have to have the, the full body joy of it. And, and also it's exhausting, just like writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think you did have that answer. That's yeah, that's it. We can, we can, we can go on on that, but we'll, <laughs> what, um, uh, when your book came out, of course, it, it was a really just challenging time in the world and, um, you know, the pandemic and, and the race inequality that was coming so strongly to the surface and a lot of books um, got lost in that in that time period. Um, what for you has been the most frustrating part of of the, the publishing process or um, publication for you um, with this book? Um, the most frustrating part, I guess, I mean, it's, you know, we've all been dealing with the most frustrating parts. I think as a parent mm -hmm. who also had kids go on to Zoom at the moment my book was launching and we were all fighting for um, bandwidth, literally, like, to be able to do a Facebook Live while you also need to be in your science class. Um, that was just like, you know, that was mind numbing. And maybe if this had been a book that I took two years on, it would have felt like, well, okay, like I'll write another one. But this book was 10 years of my life. Um, and my kids are, at, you know, 11 and 13. So it's sort of like my third kid. And it was struggling all three of them at once. So that was probably the most frustrating. I do feel like my team and Scribner Books, like everybody just figured out everything they could as quick as they could. And I was kind of blown away by like the camaraderie of publishing and authors and friends like you and bookstores, like making it all work. And that was, that was, that felt so good at a time when you felt so disconnected from everybody, right? So that was like this real, it was like, you know, just the mix of tragedy and, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, how are we so, still such a tight knit community? It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. A lot, a lot to be thankful for. Um, yeah. Um, how are we doing on questions and, and time? I, for some reason, my time is not showing up in my I'm showing uh, thing. For an hour on mine. We've been on for an hour. Yes. That was oh, We are being told that we have a few more minutes to talk. We have, okay. Um, well, then I have I have some more to talk about. Um, oh, I've got one. I know I've got a question. So there's a there's absent mothers and dysfunctional parents are are kind of key players in this story. Um, uh, and you capture that emotional complexity um, of these struggling parents so well. Um, was there a parent in this? novel uh, that was the most challenging to write about? Um, and did any of their behaviors surprise you as you were writing about them? Um, Mona was definitely the hardest for me to write. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say she's necessarily based on any one person or anything like that, but it, she was she was fairly cruel um, in her mothering of Rory. I also, I understood why, um, but it was hard to get it was hard for me to embody. It was like uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. Gus was so easy for me to write and I could have given Gus his own book, mostly just because he was like, you know, Jeff Bridges. Like I could just, it was, that was how he came to me and it was just easy to spend time with him. And um, just, you know, a, a folksy character who had all kinds of damage. Um, and I do, I think, you know, good people do bad things and he did um and then sarah who is uh the mother of the child who is tragically injured in the beginning of the book and she also has a teenage daughter that was the parent that i probably identified the most because when i with the most because when i started writing the book i had a i had a small infant and she mm -hmm. feels like unhinged with the lack of sleep. And it was sort of her anxiety I really identified with when I started writing that character. Um, but she, you know, she ends up having to check herself into cliffside mental, you know, <laughs> she, she has a very hard time. Well, yeah, I can, and understandably so. I think this is such a fantastic book club 
book because there are all these um, you know issues and issues that we're dealing with now, yeah. you know, in the world and issues that we dealt with, you know, back in, in that time. Um, I've got a question here from Barbara Solomon, who um, she, she, her question is, uh, did you write the story chronologically or did you jump around between decades and characters? Um, very complex structure to story is, is a comment she has as well. Right. Um, you know, it's funny, the new book I'm working on, I also know how it ends. So this book I knew, I'm like, apparently this is the thing I do. I always know how a book ends, I guess. So I knew that this book ended in the fire um, and it was really getting, um, and I knew that the, the 1993 stories needed to start in the summer when it was super hot, just atmospherically, I needed to, to layer that in. So I did write chronologically, um, from the beginning. And then it was it was Charlie's 2015 storyline that I ended up having to, to pull out and give its own chapters. So originally Charlie's voice was interwoven throughout the 1993 chapters. She did not have her own, um, she did not bookend each section of the stories. Oh, okay. So that was a big shift um, that didn't happen until after I'd sold the book honestly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's that thing with structure. You think you're done and then you got to shift things and move things. And as you said, right up until the end, probably. Yes. Yeah. And I think maybe that's sort of my, I like a formal challenge. So I think knowing how something is going to end, um, mm. end its own kind of challenges. So just getting, getting all the beats of a story in before this set deadline. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also a question about, speaking of Jeff Bridges, um, the, the novel is so wonderfully atmospheric and imbued with rich layered characters, it would lend so well to film adaptation. Um, is there any talk of that? Can Are you allowed to uh, give us a little insight? I'm not allowed to talk about anything in terms of any options or anything like that, but I do, I, I have a little bit of a background in television because I grew up with my mother wrote TV and there was definitely, I felt myself wanting to make something episodic. That's all I'll say. I know like as I wrote the chapters, I was like, oh, that would be a good episode. <laughs> um, yeah. That, no, I don't, I can't really say anything. It is very cinematic. Absolutely um, agree on that. Uh, I also have a question about, um, Always interested to know who are writers that have influenced you in your writing and why. Please share. Sure. Um, I mean, on this book, Louise Erdrich was a big influence. Um, and Joy Williams is a big influence on me. I think that sort of the way that she sees the living and the dead um, and the way that she has this sort of permeant or permeable um, barrier, especially in her book, um, oh my gosh, the, the Quick and the Dead. Sorry, that was like a Bible for me, The Quick and the Dead. And her character, Alice, in that book was um, very influential on um, Rory and her connection to nature. She doesn't actually speak to ghosts the way Alice does in that book. But um, uh, also, I mean, Jasmine Ward also a uh, big influence. Again, there's this permeable layer between um, the living and the dead. I knew that, you know, I was going to have characters die in this book and I, I wanted people to feel the pull of them on them. Um, mm -hmm. so I, didn't, I didn't have that wall get crossed. So those, all of the, all three of those authors have that um, in common. And uh, well, Aaron Kyle, I, you know, that really sparked the horses for me. Um, Annie Prue, as I said, huge influence just on Wyoming and also her level of prose. I just, I feel like I want, I could live in any one of her pages and <laughs> just keep, keep going over sentences. Um, you know, to be able to write at that level of language is totally aspirational for me. Yeah. yeah, I know books, you know, we could go on and on about great authors and there's there's such a richness of, of stories and writers out there that it's it's a never ending list, right, of, of influences. But those are really good, 
good examples you gave of, of some of those. And I can, I can see that in your work. Um, um, I had a question. I have to find all new influences now though, because I'm ready. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> that, that brings to mind, is there, I know last time we spoke, you were working on something. Are you working on another novel? I am working on another novel, definitely. Oh, good, good, yeah. because I want to read another Kate Milliken novel. I don't for know sure. if my brain is ever. I've written a few short stories since I wrote this book, but I just have a very hard time, um, like turning people down, characters down enough to let them go in a short story. It seems. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's mostly novels for me going forward. Yeah. Well, we can't wait to see what you come up with next. And I, I just encourage anyone to, to read this book. I promise you won't be disappointed. It's just, um, you know, I, I remember the first time I read the advanced copy and just emailing you, I was just like ecstatic and just so proud of you. And, um, and just what a, really what a sophisticated writer you are you know, in both story and prose and- um, That was like the best and, email, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's hard putting a book out into the world, right? You just, you don't know. And the, there's always going to be that, that play. Um, so I just, I'm so proud of you, Kate. And um, I love that we've reconnected after all these years. It's incredible. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> so- I'm I'm going to step back in and I want to say, I don't know what's more stunning and fascinating. Uh, this beautifully written book that was one of my favorites um, or your connection, which I had no knowledge of going into this event. That's an amazing story of how your lives crossed for real and became part of the story that you're now celebrating and discussing. Um, I love that. <laughs> Crazy. I know. I, I think we could go on the road with this, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> How to manifest your friends. <laughs> yes, I think you should. Um, and um, thank you both so much. Um, a beautiful conversation about a very, um, I think, important literary fiction book uh, that has definitely has come out in the last year, year and a half. Um, and I'm sorry that Book Passage didn't get to officially celebrate it during the pandemic, so to speak. Um, but I'm glad we're here with the paperback version, um, which I know you mentioned, Melissa, but I want to remind everybody that uh, that's what we have right now in Book Passage. And you should definitely avail yourselves of this. Um, it's um, very accessible and affordable. There's no excuse not to take it with you uh, to the beach or <laughs> vacationing or having labor upcoming. Is it Labor Day that's coming up? Holiday plans? I'll just say holiday. Um, so please do that and feel safe in coming into Book Passage. We are open um, in Corte Madera and also San Francisco locations. And also, but if you don't want to, or you don't live in the Bay Area, um, obviously you can pick up the phone or send your order in online. We're happy to accommodate you. And um, we're also lucky that Kate came in. Obviously you came in the store because we have signed copies, uh, which are just like gold these days. <laughs> and I don't think people get that because authors are not really traveling. Um, so it's really hard to get uh, signed books that aren't either they're not signed or they're only on book plates, which are fine, but it's a real treat to get uh, the author who has come in and taken the time to actually sign the book. So take advantage and come and get that or order it or call us online. Uh, Melissa, Kate, thank you again for this lovely afternoon discussion. Uh, thank you to uh, all those that came in to participate and for your great questions. And I know there are going to be more in the archives, and we really appreciate your support of Book Passage. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you, Paula. Thank you.